have you all here. I'm so surprised that you visited me this evening this way. <laughs> that mandatory thing in the email. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for the Fall Masters Colloquium. Uh, please come on in. A full house. So um, before we get started, we do have an announcement. My assistant Mary wanted to share this announcement with everyone. So we just want to let you know that Thursday, October 25th is Master's Student Appreciation Day. Master's Student Appreciation Day. So be sure to stop by for some free beverages and baked goods made by the psychology faculty. When is this? The 25th of October. Where should they go to get their three babies? <laughs> <laughs> you see, we practice. This is well rehearsed. Routine. Marilyn Hall, entryway outside room 242. Everyone's got to have this. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't received an email, you will shortly from Tracy. Thank you, Mary. Excellent job. Uh, basically, so what will happen is all faculty are bringing in baked goods and beverages and this is the Thursday before Halloween, and between basically the half hour before 4.30 classes and the half hour before the 6.50 classes on the second floor of Maryland Hall. So, come on, the tour bus arrived, come on in. So, did anyone attend this last year? And what was it like, was it great? You had really good baked goods? The beverages were the best? Okay, so there you are. You heard it from the experts. So you'll get an email from Tracy. You'll see these flyers around. But so this is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, so the goal of this fall colloquium is to talk about business of practice issues, and it's actually come to my attention because lots of master students told me it last year that there was a desire for more training on how to start a practice, how to go into practice. How do you know if private practice is for you? Should you? join a pre-existing group, um, should you be an independent contractor or an employee, solo practice, group practice, how do you make a business plan, and just, where do you learn this stuff? You don't, have, you don't have any ideas where you learn that stuff? Here. <laughs> Not yet, but hopefully. So good answer. So um, I'm going to share sort of just some intro introductory information with you, but I also want to share with you that I've created a new course that's an elective that will be offered for the first time in the first summer session called Business of Practice and Entrepreneurship. And I have a syllabus that I made that I'll be showing you to give you an idea of some of the types of things that will be in that. And it will be offered probably to start the first summer session every other year. Um, but if there's lots of interest in it, then we'll offer it more frequently. So it's really, there, there, there's no place to learn the business skills that go into with being a practitioner. And unless you're planning to become a researcher working you know, in a lab or you know, getting a job as a salaried employee somewhere, you know, most people who become mental health professionals want to go into practice. And there's really no training for that part of it. And really what we have here now at Loyola is, so you'll take you know, theories of counseling and psychotherapy and principles and practices and different electives, and, you know, whether it's psychodynamic or family, group, and so on, and you'll learn to be a clinician. And if you're in the clinical track, you'll learn how to do assessments and evaluations. But nowhere in there does it really talk about the business of practice, how to be a business person. And the reality is, if you're going to have a practice, you will be a business owner or a business person. And you know, there's typically not much training for that. So you know, like things like, how do you set fees? How much should you charge? I mean, more is better than less, right? Okay, so that's a good thing. But you know, really, how do you decide how much is appropriate to charge? And does that change over the course of your career? Or how do you develop niche areas of practice? Even how do you advertise and market your practice? And there's definitely a difference between advertising and marketing. And you know, there's this mentality that some may have that sort of this idea if you build it, they will come. So you can just you know, once you're licensed, you can lease office space or rent a, 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 an office somewhere and 
maybe take out an ad, you know, to advertise your practice or create a website, and then just sit there and wait and see what happens. And people won't come to your office and give you bake goods. You'll be sitting there by yourself. And you have to have a plan for how to market your practice. You know, who are the likely referral sources for the type of work that you do? And what information do you need to share with them? How do you inform them of the availability of these services? And then once you get that very special first referral, you know, what do you do then? You know, are there things you do afterwards to try to encourage additional referrals coming? And so there's a lot that goes into establishing and running a, a business. And so I want, I want to highlight some of the key issues for you. So in the 
beginning, before you have your own referral sources and you establish a reputation in the community, and they already have referrals, you're sort of, in a sense, paying for that until you get established. So that's one potential benefit. The other benefits or drawbacks that you can see or you can think about in these situations? depends on how much you pay. You would be paying for those things individually otherwise whether or not it would be a good deal. So you have to look at the cost of all those individual things. Right. And so as a business person, you would actually create a business plan. And you would learn how to create a business plan and what the components are. And what are all the expenses that go into having a practice or running a practice. And if you look into how much does it cost to rent your own space, and to rent furniture that's not furnished, and to get a phone, and you know, all the different things you have to do, and see how much would that cost me per month. And then based on, hypothetically, this is the number of clients per week I'm planning to see, and here's what I'm charging, here's how much I think I'll be collecting, and then make a comparison to see, is this a good deal or not? So it might be a great deal, it might be terrible. The good thing is you can't regulate how many referrals you get. If they're giving you 30 referrals a week, and you're turning them down, you're so busy, that's terrific. If you get two referrals, and then you're just sort of sitting there, you, know, you have bills to pay. And there's no guarantee that the referrals are necessarily coming in. So there'd be some research you do about you know, how many people are in their group, how many clients do they see, what types of clients are they seeing, are you going to be competing with other members of the group for clients? So if you're a child psychologist and you've got, or a counselor and they've got five others, you know, that's going to be competition. If you're the only child person, and that's why they're hiring you, because they have all these referrals, but no one to see them, so you know, oh, I'll get all those referrals, maybe that's a good deal then. But let's just say you're charging $100 per session, and let's say the contract is 50%, so they keep $50 per client that's collected for all these expenses, for all the services they're providing, and again, they're also providing referrals, so I don't know how you value that, but that's part of what you have to do in your business plan. What is it worth to you to get these referrals? And then they're receiving $50 out of every uh, hour of the service you provide. So is there anyone here who thinks, when, you know, if you first get licensed, working 35 hours a week, making $50 an hour would be good? That sounds great. <laughs> now, the wording of the contract is gonna be really important because what if 10 years later, you now develop this reputation in the community and you're getting your own referrals. Not only that, so you're not, you're not relying on the practice for referrals anymore, you have so many that you're actually giving the group extra referrals and they've hired someone else to take some of those referrals and they're still getting 50% from you. So 10 years later, you're still making $50 an hour. What seems so good when you're first starting out and all your colleagues who went into solo private practice we started out much slower than you, so initially they weren't getting that money, but now they're collecting $150 a session, and their expenses are only $30. And so they're making $120 an hour after 10 years to your 50. And so what could be really great when you're first starting out might not look so good as time goes by. And so then that gets into the contract. This idea is, is 50% of collecting fees a good deal for you. And again, what might be a good deal your first year out might be a terrible deal 10 years out. And what does the contract specify? What does it stipulate? How many of you have already graduated from law school? So in that case, you probably should not be reading legal contracts and making decisions about what the parameters of the contract might be and if it's in your best interest to sign it. Who would you recommend going to for that? Someone said a baker? <laughs> no, it's a lawyer, an attorney. So, well, wait a second, that's expensive. That could cost like $300 to have them review a contract. You can't afford it. Who can, who, can you afford $300 to have someone review a contract for you? You could. It's better than having to pay the cost of a no compete clause or something else in that contract that will bite you later that will cost you more than $300. Right, so if you get paid $300 to not sign that contract, basically, or to negotiate the contract so the wording is more in your favor, that's saving you tens of thousands of dollars over time. Um, one of the rules for business of practice 
is always negotiate from a position of strength. <coughs> if you're feeling desperate and you'll sign anything, it's not going to be a good contract for you. And I can assure you, any contract that a practice presents to you to sign was written by their attorney with their best interests at heart. It's to their benefit. You need to have your own attorney who you hire who's going to review it and tell you, you know, let me explain to you what the parameters of this contract include, such as a non-compete clause, which means that if you ever leave this practice and break this contract, you cannot practice this profession within a five-mile radius or 30-mile radius, whatever it says in the contract, for two years or three years, or whatever the period of time is. That can really uh, make it difficult to earn a living. You probably want to understand that beforehand. You might think, oh, that could never happen. Well, again, if you're signing a contract where you're limiting your earnings for the rest of your career, you're going to want to break the contract. Well, there is an alternative to the non-complete clause. It'll be in the contract. It's usually you have to pay them a one-time fee of $60,000. Oh, sure. I'll just write you a check right now. <laughs> you know, so again, the $300 or whatever the attorney's one hour of his or her time would be to review the contract and rewrite it, and then you present that and say, I'm very interested in working with you, but... I, you say, but my attorney has reviewed this. I said, attorney. I have my own attorney. My attorney reviewed this, and we've modified this for your review. If you're comfortable signing this now, I'm more than happy to you know, move forward with our arrangement, or you know, our business arrangement. But if you're not, then perhaps this just might not work out. You have to be willing to walk away. If you are desperate, if you're willing to sign anything, chances are it's not going to be in your best interest. Two professionals that we have to hire uh, in general when we're in practice. One's an attorney, the other's an accountant, unless you have expertise in those two areas. Uh, there's a lot of legal issues, a number of legal issues relevant to both of those that can cost us much more than the cost. So if, so if, I, if I do my own taxes for my business and don't have my CPA do it, I think, oh yeah, these are all good deductions, I'll just claim these. And then the IRS perhaps reviews it, and then they contact me, and they send me this very nice letter inviting me to their office for a review of my tax return and my documentation to support it. And then I find out, actually, not only do I owe them $26,000 more, but there's also the penalty, which was like a 26% per month penalty. So now I owe them this big, large amount because I was saving money by doing it myself. So again, we have to make decisions about you know, investing in our business. And one of the rules of success for practice is you have to spend money to make money, even how you create your office. So you probably don't want to have like, a bookshelf with cinder blocks you steal from the local building site and a little plywood planks and stuff like that. Um, you, know, you have to decide what image are you trying to convey to people so that they'll want to actually see your professional services. You know, are you instilling confidence in them? You know, should you hire someone to help you make your website? Or do you have the skills to make one yourself? Websites are easy. There's enough templates. And that's actually something students will do in this course that I've mentioned. Um, but there's a number of issues just in terms of you know, when you are thinking about establishing your practice that you have to consider. So again, I've mentioned about contracts and about being an employee versus an independent contractor. Certainly there's more detail on those, but just to have a sense that these things exist is really important. Nicole? I have a question going back to location. So what is like the view of using your own residence? So a home office. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Think of the money you can save. What if you just do it like in the family room? Or the living room? <laughs> can you think of any potential drawbacks? Now, if people have a home, I'm joking. If people have a home office, it's truly a separate office with a separate entrance. But there's a number of factors you have to consider. Is it possible you might have certain clients who you would not want knowing where you live? <laughs> you might not want at your home. I mean, it depends on the kind of work you do. Like, let's say you have contracts with, you know, the Department of Probation and Parole <laughs> doing counseling. I'm thinking a home office is not what I'm going to do. There's many conveniences. It's a very short commute. Um, if there's bad weather, you can get there. If you have little breaks, you can just go back into your house, you can get a little laundry going, you can have lunch, you know, 
watch a TV show, take a nap, you know, it's a much more flexible. I'm not saying you should take a nap every hour. You're trying to earn a living too. But there's certain conveniences. But if you have, you know, a family and children and you know soundproofing issues or bicycles and skateboards in the front yard, you know, you have to just decide is it appropriate. Then those professionals who do have a home office typically will go through sort of like a vetting process of the clients before they invite them to their office to make sure it's appropriate. So someone who has a history of violence or aggression, probably not a good idea for a late night appointment when you're there alone, things like that. But it is potentially a cost savings because the square footage of the home office is then the tax deduction as are all your business expenses. So legitimate business expenses can be um, deducted from your taxes. What's legitimate and how much you deduct, that's what your account goes in for a tax return. I haven't told you what to do, but give you some factors to consider. Um, there are issues about your staff. So if you have a receptionist, if you have a typist or transcriptionist, if you hire people to work in your practice, there are all sorts of issues there. You are responsible as the business owner for them, for what they do. So that has implications for training them, hiring them, firing them. Maybe you even have to then know about employment law. What questions are you allowed to ask in a job interview? What things are you not allowed to ask? What are the legitimate grounds for firing someone? Uh, is there a process you have to go through? You just fire them automatically if they do something wrong? And so, yeah, these are things you have to learn as part of the business of practice before you start running your business. And you don't really learn those in your counseling and assessment courses. Um, I'm not going to go through everything here, but there's certain things I want to get to. So fee setting and adjustments. Um, what would be a good amount to, how much are you worth in terms of what's a good amount for you to charge when you graduate, when you open your practice? Yeah, what people are going to pay. What people are going to pay. <laughs> I think you can definitely get them to pay $10 a session. I'm confident you could. So the dilemma here is you don't want to undercharge because also there's a, there's social psychology implications of devaluing your services, and there are, sometimes people see something that's very expensive and they think oh, that's better, you know? but you don't want to overcharge yourself out of the market either. And so figuring out what's an appropriate amount to charge based upon the services you provide, your level of experience and expertise, and even the market. So you would have to do a market analysis of the local community based on professionals who provide similar services. So what would be in a market, what's a market analysis? Like what's something you could do to find out what people charge in your local area? Now, what can you do? Records. Like check around at other offices, websites, see if they're running into our area. So you can actually go find out. So you can actually call other professionals and you know, say, hi, I'm interested in finding out about the services you offer. Uh, what are the fees that you charge? You have to say, hello, this is an anonymous call. <laughs> call an expert on their website, they have their fees. But you, know, you have to have some guidance. If everyone in your local community charges $80, $100 a session,